to another episode of Traces of the Lost World. Today we are at Little Apache Dam in the Robledo Mountains and we are talking to Spencer Lucas about how we come to see all of these marine fossils and what is the connection to being able to see marine fossils and trackways. Right. Okay, my, I'm Spencer Lucas. I'm the curator of paleontology at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History in Albuquerque. And here at this location in the Robledo Mountains, we're standing on limestone beds, layers of limestone that are just full of fossil shells. And one of the interesting things about this whole area is we not only get the footprints, which are the trace fossils of animals that were living on land, but we also get the shells of the types of animals that were living in the shallow sea that covered this part of New Mexico 280 million years ago. So when we look at these layers as geologists or paleontologists, what we see amazingly, since we're here in the desert now, is evidence that a warm, shallow sea, much like the Caribbean Ocean today, was covering this area hundreds of millions of years ago. And when we look at the limestones themselves, the, the best evidence that the sea was here is in the shells of the fossils that we find. Because the kinds of animals that we see here preserved are animals like clams and snails and then a, a type of animal that most people don't know, brachiopods, they're kind of clam-like. But these are animals that live today in the sea. And so when we see their fossils in the rocks, we can make that strong connection. You know, it's one of the great principles of geology that the present is the key to the past. So we look at the, the present day animals and where they live and then we look at their past, their extinct relatives that we find as fossils. And we're able to be very certain that there was a sea here and these shells preserve evidence of that sea. So we would be underwater. If we had if been we, here. If we had been here how long ago? If we had been here in the early Permian, 280 million years ago, we would have been underwater. We would have been probably at least 100 feet underwater <laughs> to get to this sea bottom. But this would have been a lot like if you've gone anywhere in the Caribbean or you've gone to Florida and you've gone snorkeling and you would snorkel around. It, it, these would have been very clear waters, very warm waters. They, there would have been sunlit bottoms and shallow water. It would have been a, a, just a wonderful place to be. And there would have also even been sharks living here because we have found shark's teeth in these limestones. So there, there would have been some dangerous animals, but it wouldn't have been any more dangerous probably than it is today to swim in such a shallow sea. So we get to see both plant and animal remains or prints in this limestones here? Well, no, in the limestones we don't see, uh, really, well, we see some plants, we see some algae mm -hmm. that were living under the sea, but we have to go up the hill behind us here to get to the red layers that were that formed on land, and they have the tracks and the, and the leaves and the, the plant fossils in them. Here we're in, definitely in the sea. Well, this is a really unusual fossil here. The Probably some of the biggest animals that swam in this sea are animals, we, we call them cephalopods. They're related, they're the, they're the extinct relatives of living squid and octopuses. And this thing was a big nautiloid. It's, part, it's only part of the shell. So this thing would have had a huge tube-like shell and it's been, it's been broken open and you're only seeing one side of it preserved here in the rock. So we not only see the fossils of animals that actually lived on the sea bottom, like the clams or the snails, but we also see the fossils of animals that were swimming in the water column above the sea, and then when they died, their shells would sink down to the bottom and get fossilized here. So this is a, and, and this would have been an animal that would have been swimming in the water column. It was a hunting type of animal, it was a predator. It would have been swimming around looking for its prey items, probably mostly eating things that lived on the sea bottom, as do modern squid today. What always amazes me when I see these shell beds is just to think about how much biological productivity, how much life there was here, and now it's all gone. I mean, this, this represents, I mean, if you were just thinking of it as seafood, as, as something you would eat at a, at a seafood restaurant, I mean, there's, there's just a tremendous amount of biological material in all these shells. There was a lot of life here. This was a good place to live during the Permian. It was a really um, rich environment. We're looking here at a sea bottom where we have a remarkable amount of diversity of many, many different kinds of shells and parts of shells. 
And this, this isn't surprising to see because we know that these sea bottoms were in the tropical uh, latitudes at the time the rocks were formed. And we know today that when we go to the tropics, we see higher diversity than we see outside of the tropics. And so this fits a kind of, uh, again, that present is the key to the past. There were a tremendous number of species living on the seafloor. That's what we mean by diversity, that just the number of kinds of animals that were living here. And in a tropical sea like this, 280 million years ago, we see high diversity which is something we see today in tropical seas. And so that tells us that, that, that whatever's driving diversity, whatever causes high diversity, has been doing it for hundreds of millions of years. So if we want to understand diversity, we have to explain it as something that we know has been going on for, for many hundreds of millions of years, just like diversity is today.